studying in, in the first Kings and and we've been observing that since the division of Israel into the northern and southern kingdoms that uh, the 16th chapter when we got to last week we just saw these five sorry even six sorry kings in the northern kingdom and and Israel's descent this sordid descent into gross idolatry as they departed from the word of God they departed from the priests of God and and it's just it's just a sad sad picture and the, and the chapter ends up with them putting a man on the throne by the name of Ahab and and this man um, Ahab in the 16th chapter he did evil above all that were before him he actually married a woman that was the daughter of F Baal the king of the Zidonians and she worshiped and served Baal and he started to do the same thing and he built and reared an altar for Baal and built a big house for Baal the false god right in the middle of Samaria which is where he was ruling from and and not only that uh, they rebuilt the, the city of Jericho which God said you'd be cursed if you do that and they were they were in a terrible 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 way and one might expect that at a time like this in their history because they've been they've had the written law they've had good king like David uh, Solomon they, they've had a good priest they've they've had a holy temple that was built exceeding magnificent and here they they've departed and they've cast the God of Israel off and you might think God would cast them off but when we get to the 17th chapter just to the opposite to the contrary when Israel is plagued with a bad king God blesses them with a good prophet and on the pages of Scripture will march in the 17th chapter a man named Elijah. Elijah is God's man. I mean, never was a king so bold to sin as Ahab, and never was a prophet so bold to stand and rebuke and reprove the spiritual wickedness in the high places as Elijah. Elijah's story begins right here in chapter 17. And this chapter and the rest of his story is full of wonders. Scarcely any part of the Old Testament history shines brighter than the story, the history of the spirit and the power of Elijah, as Jesus mentioned in the New Testament. Of all the prophets, only Elijah will have the honor of Enoch. And we'll see later on in Second Kings chapter 2 that he will be carried up by chariots of fire as he does not see death. He's translated just like Enoch did back in Genesis. And not only that, he will have the honor of the great prophet Moses because he will attend our Savior on the Mount of Transfiguration in the New Testament as Moses does. We will look uh, through the scriptures and we'll notice that in the Old Testament there are many prophets, many writing prophets. They prophesied. They wrote. Elijah wrote nothing. There's no written record from Elijah. He prophesied and he acted. He left no writings. But his actions shine forth right to this present hour. Elijah is God's man. In this chapter, this uh, short chapter when he's introduced, it'll break down into four parts. In the first part will be Elijah's prophecy. And he's going to prophesy the famine that will come. And then you'll see Elijah's provision from God for food during the time of the famine. And then you'll see Elijah's promise to a widow woman. And then finally, we'll see Elijah's power in raising the widow's son when he dies. It's a great chapter. It's very interesting. And it's just going to open up the saga of the man of God in the hour of need. That's Elijah. Now, now here we read in verse 1. It starts out like this. And Elijah, probably connected to the last verse of the chapter before, in his days, that'd be Ahab, did Hiel the Bethelite build Jericho and laid the foundation thereof in Abiram his firstborn and set up the gates thereof in his youngest son Segob according to the word of the Lord which he spake by Joshua the son of Nun. And while all this wickedness is going on and Elijah the Tishbite 
who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And here he bursts on the scene. He, it's as if he drops out of the sky, <laughs> just like later on in the next book, he'll be carried away by chariots of fire back into the sky. He, he comes down almost like Melchizedek, without mother, without father, without descent, no record of his parentage, no record of his lineage. As a matter of fact, because of this, many of the Jewish rabbis used to think that, that Elijah was an angel. Now, now we know from the New Testament he's not an angel. Because in the book of James, it says, uh, I'll just read it to you quickly. It says, El Elias, that's Elijah, was, was a man subject to like passions as we are. He wasn't an angel. He was a man. He was God's man. God's man to reprove and rebuke and stand for the word of God in the time of apostasy and idolatry. Just what God needs. God will not leave himself without a witness in any time. He's always had preachers. He had Enoch preaching to the ungodly. He had Noah preaching. He's had preachers all throughout history. And he's got a man right here. And he's a rough spirit. Uh, he, he was a man of strong passion, James tells us in the New Testament. Strong passion, probably strong, hot, spiritual passion. Bolder than most men. Willing to stand when others wilt and others fall. Rough spirits are caused to rough service. Elijah was strong and he was fit to deal with the emboldened sinners of his time. And so wonderfully does God suit his men to the work that he designs for them. It starts out, and Elijah, the Tishbite, Elijah, the name Elijah. It's a combination of, of two words that were important to the Jews. El, El Elohim, that's God. And Jah, that's the Lord, Jehovah. It's the, his name is saying, Elijah, God is my Lord. My God is the Lord. You know, that name Elijah is found 69 times in 63 verses in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, his name, and by the way, you'll notice this, something I noticed years ago in, in my readings. Often these Old Testament names, El, that's God, Jah, that's the Lord. So he's saying it's like my God is the Lord. And that's Old Testament, Elijah. But in the New Testament, they change his name to Elias. And a lot of times you'll find these names are changed to the A-S in the New Testament because my God is Jesus, the Savior of the New Testament. And in the New Testament, Elias is mentioned 30 times in 30 verses. So I thought that was curious as I put together the mentions of his name in Scripture. 69 plus 30 equals 99. That's a fruit doubled. He was a fruitful man of God. He was a fruitful preacher. He was full of the fruit of the Spirit. He had the, the passion and the strength and the spiritual power that God gave him for his time. Uh, Elijah, uh, he's uh, consecrated. Uh, I mean, think of the name. It's a consecrated name. My God is the Lord. In other words, my God is the Lord. My God is not Baal. At the time when they're worshiping Baal. He, he's courageous. We're going to see him stand up to King Ahab. To march right into the courts of the king and point the figure, finger at him. Ahab doctrinally is a picture of the Antichrist. And, and he's capable. Here he's Elijah the Tishbite. Okay, the town uh, Tisba is a town over in Gilead. Back in Numbers 32, we see that Gilead uh, was uh, given, uh, again, in the, in the nation Israel. Here's the Mediterranean Sea, and let's say here's the nation here, and he's in the northern part. But along here, on the right-hand side, just to the east, is the Sea of Galilee, and then a river that runs along here, the Jordan River, and then empties into the Dead Sea down here. And he's over here in Gilead. He's from an area that was a very rough area to live in. It had many attacks 
constantly by foreign tribes, the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, all lived in this area, and they were under constant attack. He was a strong man. Tisba was a town. It made him a capable, strong man. And it says he's the Gileadite. His region is over there in Gilead, and that's the eastern portion there. And so he comes from the east, and he crosses into the land, and he begins preaching. Now notice, notice what he starts, and he says, Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall be not dew nor rain these years, but according to my words. He's got three things to say. Number one, the Lord God of Israel liveth. God is not dead. The Lord God of Israel is alive. The Lord, Ahab, the Lord God of Israel is alive and he's sovereign. That thing you just built a statue to, that, that uh, area over there where you built an altar, and you've got that image for Baal, that thing is dead. That thing is impotent. That thing is nothing. My God, the Lord God of Israel liveth, he's alive and he's sovereign. Why are you following dead idols? That's the first thing he tells them. And then the next thing he says, before whom I stand. In other words, I stand before the Lord, not before you, Ahab. I understand you're putting out orders that people are to come and worship Baal. I don't stand before you when it comes to the worship of my heart and my conscience and my soul and my spirit and my will. I stand before the living God. By the way, who do you stand before? Who determines who you stand before and who you bow down before? That's, that's the one thing that uh, in the revolution of the United States of America is that what they wanted to understand was that God gave two tables of the law. You see table one, I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not make a graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. Thou shalt honor the Sabbath. That's table one. Table two, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. And what they understood in the United States of America is that the government can enforce table one, but only your heart and conscience can determine or excuse me, the government can enforce table two, but only your heart and conscience should decide what you do with table one. No government should tell you who to bow down to. Bow down to. And here's Ahab telling these people, bow down to Baal, follow Baal, come to the temple of Baal. And he says, I stand before the Lord. I'm living according to the light of conscience who's brought me before the Lord. Not you, Ahab. Not your corrupt kingdom. Not your ridiculous idols. And and so number one, the Lord God of Israel liveth, he's alive and sovereign, I stand before him, I serve him, not you, and, and now let me give you not only the sovereign and the service, but the sentence is this, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And so he brings forth the sovereignty, the service, and the sentence that all comes from Almighty God. God is sovereign. If you're wise, you serve him. And you understand if you do not, God will bring a sentence upon you and all that do not. And so he brings it right before the king. So, so here comes at this time of idolatry and apostrophe, uh, apostasy, God's man stands and he comes forward with the truth. Israel must be punished for their sins. Idolatry must be punished. Apostasy must be punished. God's people who name the name of God when they depart from the living God must be punished by their God. That's the truth. So, so what and the why and the wherefore and the how? Well, what's going to happen is the fruitful land will not have dew nor rain. The land of milk and honey that should be fruitful will now be barren. God will turn the land into a desert. That's a picture of their spiritual condition. Spiritually, there was no fruit. Spiritually, in that land, there was no water of the rain of heaven. They had turned from the Levitical law. They had turned from the temple. They had turned from God's priests. They had turned from God's kingdom. And they had turned to Baal and idolatry. And that leads to desert, barren condition in the heart and in the soul. And God says, I'm going to let the land reflect what's going on in your heart. I'm going to give you a spiritual picture by this punishment. This is going to be a portrait. That's why I'm doing it. For the iniquity that dwells in the land, I'm going to make the land reflect it. That's the what and the why. Go back, for example, to uh, 
Exodus uh, 34. Now these are God's people. These aren't Moabites. These aren't Canaanites. These are Israelites. Israelites not indeed. Israelites with guile in their mouth and iniquity in their heart. And it has to be punished. Back in Exodus chapter 34. Back at that time, after the people had done a similar thing and had built a golden calf. Verse 1, The Lord said unto Moses, You thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first. And uh, verse 2, Be ready in the morning and come in the morning to Mount Sinai and present thyself there to me in the top of the mount. And, and up there, what happened was when Moses got up there, verse 5, the Lord descended in the cloud and he stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, to the third and fourth generation. And here they are in Israel now with a temple for Baal. And the king is going. And the king is taking common priests of the lowest people. And they're going. And they're setting up feast days. And they're bringing the nation in. And fathers and mothers are bringing children before Baal. And God says, I've got to punish and visit that iniquity on the fathers and on the children. And I'm going to bring barren wilderness of drought and famine to the land. Uh, he, he said... Uh, Verse 12 in the same chapter, Exodus 34, what he told them. Uh, verse 11, watch. Observe that which I command thee this day. In other words, God says, observe my commandments. Behold, I drive out before thee the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, the Jebusite. God had dispossessed the land of all those wicked idolaters, and he had put his children, the nation of Israel, in there. So they could be a testimony to the living God. And here they are a short time later and they've turned right back. He says, verse 12, Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whither thou goest, lest it be a snare in the midst of thee. Here's what you're supposed to do, verse 13. Destroy their altars, break their images, cut down their groves. Thou shalt worship no other God for the Lord, whose name is Jealous is a jealous God, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a-whoring after their gods to do sacrifice unto their gods, and one call thee, and thou eat of the sacrifice, and take of their daughters to thy sons, and their daughters go a-whoring after their gods, and make thy sons go a-whoring after their gods. Thou shalt make thee no molten gods. And there it is, and what had just happened in the last chapter, Ahab marries Jezebel, she takes him after Baal and they build an altar to Baal and God raises a man up to take his bony finger and cry aloud and spare not and point it in the face of those people that call themselves by the name of God. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Why is this happening? God gave them warning. God gave them verbal warning. God gave them written warning. And God gave them double warning. Deutero, deutero. Deutero means two. Nomi. Nomi means law. Some people, they speak of antinomianism, which means against the law. Okay? Deuteronomy is God wants to double down on the law. And here's the second time he gives a lot of these people. And he tells them in Deuteronomy chapter 28. He talks about all the blessings in verses 1 through 14, but in verse 15, but it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments. There are ten of them. And the second one says, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. 
The first one says, Thou shalt not have no other gods before me. And he says, If you don't do this, end of verse 15, curses shall come upon thee. And here, the, here it is, verse 23. And thy heaven that is over thy head shall be brass. And no more rain's going to come. Brass doesn't uh, sweat, do. And the earth shall be iron, and no crops will grow. And the Lord shall make the rain of thy land powder and dust. From heaven it shall come down upon thee till it be destroyed. And, and Elijah said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years. God warned them. God forewarned them. The faithfulness of God. God is faithful. That's why He's given us His written word. So we'll never stand in doubt. So we can know that we know that we know that these are the words of the living God. The Lord God of Israel liveth. He's not dead. And His word lives on. Heaven and earth shall pass away. But His word endureth forever. And He gave him the word. Now, now, historically, we see the mess going on in Israel. Historically, we see a, a wicked king named Ahab. And thankfully, historically, we see God's man, God's prophet, proclaiming God's word, preaching God's word. Now, now, now how he went, he went and he told the king. Notice, now, Elijah knew this is not according to God's word. What the king is doing is wrong. What he did not do was go to the people throughout the land and whisper to them and start a bunch of murmuring and teach them to, to disobey the government and have sit-ins. No, he went right to the top. He went right to the king, the one who could reform the land, the one who could make the decree, the one who could prevent the judgment. When there's spiritual wickedness at the top, you go right to the top. If, if you're in a place where the leader is wicked and you have opportunity, you go right directly and you tell him. Now again, we're talking about spiritual leadership. We full well understand that in the New Testament, there is a separation of church and state. We expect spiritual wickedness in high places in government because the God with a little g the God of this world runs this present evil world so we do not expect good leaders we fully expect leaders to call evil good and good evil but here in the confines of God's kingdom the church spiritual wickedness in high places needs to be addressed by a prophet that will go right to the leader and tell him God's word face to face. He doesn't need to tell the people in the pews. He needs to go right to the top. That's the way it needs to be done. And that's how he did it. Now look, it's likely, I mean, the Bible only gives us this one verse. Probably the conclusion of his sermon is what we have in verse 1. It's very likely when he stood before Ahab, he reproved him for idolatry. He reproved him for the marriage to the outlandish woman from another land. He probably reproved him for his wicked lifestyle. He probably told Ahab personally, you need to repent or judgment's going to fall on your head too. But more importantly, you need to turn back to the temple and to the Levitical priesthood, and to the feast of the Lord for the people that are underneath you. You need to repent nationally for the people and for the land so God won't bring judgment on the land. He told them how long this would last. There should be neither dew nor rain these years. How many years? I don't know how many years. He says, uh, but according to my word, in other words, don't expect any rain until you hear from me again. Why is that? Because God reveals His secrets to His servants, the prophets, and Elijah was God's prophet. 
Someone who's close to the heart of God, someone who's in communion with God, knows the secrets of what God's going to do. They can actually tell you how long a judgment is going to last and when something will change. But you've got to be close, and, and Elijah was. Now, now, in God's economy, the way this is happening, God is, is, is angry with his people because this king has usurped his authority because the king is to be underneath the prophet. Go to Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. Here's the king banishing prophets. Here's the king picking the lowest people of priests and getting rid of the Levites. Here's the king who's who's taken the position that God had given to prophet and priest and put himself in that position. And Jeremiah says, now here's, here's God speaking to Jeremiah, verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, that'd be Jeremiah, he's uh, the words of Jeremiah, verse 1, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. If any man has a gift, he need not boast of it because the gift was given by God. And the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. God's not saying sorry for whom he gifted. And we were talking about this a few weeks ago in the service. We all have different gifts. But some people God gifted from the womb to be speakers of his word, to be students of his word, to be prophets of his word. That's God's gifting. And notice what he says in verse 10 to Jeremiah. He says, see, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms. In God's economy, the prophet is the top dog. He's the top man. He's closest to God. He gets the word from God. He gives it downward. He gives it to the priest. Then the priest takes the word of God and ministers at the a temple. And he ministers at the synagogue. And the king is to sit under the hearing of the prophet and the priest. God set the prophet over the nations. That's God's economy. And the king is to obey God's prophet. And that's why... Elijah goes right to the king, tells him, you got things backwards here. And, and there won't be any rain, according to my word, until my word comes. Now, now let me give you a practical application about this. Go to Revelation chapter 1. In God's economy, the prophet rules over the king. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Now in this, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, like it says in verse 1. Here's God giving the final and the fullest revelation of Jesus Christ and how he is going to bring to consummation all the promises that are contained in the Bible. When the time of the book of Revelation ends, all of the promises that are yea and amen in Jesus Christ will be fulfilled. And here he's revealing these things, and he says, verse 5, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests, unto God and His Father. But what's the economy? Who's on the top? Prophets are on the top. And who's underneath? Kings and priests. Now, note, what have we been made? We've been made kings and priests, according to that verse, Revelation 1.6. I'll give you a confirming verse so it's no private interpretation. Back up a few books to 1 Peter chapter 2 and look at verse 9. Now, speaking to us, practical. This is practical application. It 
See, in in First Peter chapter two, verse two, we're newborn babes, and we desire the milk of the word that we may grow thereby. What else also are we? Verse nine, we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Royal royalty is kingly priesthood. We are kings and priests. That's what we are. You know what we're under? We're under the prophets. Go to Second Peter chapter three. Second Peter chapter three. I'm a king. I'm a priest. Okay. Then in God's economy, let me show you where we stand. Second Peter chapter three. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance that ye, you, ro you royal priesthood, that you kings and priests may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. We're underneath the holy prophets. We, priests and king, are under their authority. We're under their words. We don't want to be like Ahab. We don't want to set up our own Baal. We don't want to start thinking that, that we're above God's prophet. And when a prophet speaks to us, we don't want to hear that. Go your own way. I've got my own way of doing things. We're, we're, we're under the prophets. Did you see the verses? He wants us to be mindful of the words spoken to the holy prophets because we're priests and kings and that's where we belong. And we need the word to direct us and guide us. Just as Ahab did. And if we don't, don't be surprised if we find ourselves with a spiritual famine in our life. Don't be surprised if all of a sudden our heaven is brass when we go to pray. Don't be surprised if we find ourselves dry and thirsty on the inside in, in our little piece of real estate and land. That's why the picture's there. Now, now we looked at it historically. We looked at it practically. But I told you these portraits that God gives the nation Israel are pictures of the church corporately. They're corporate pictures of the church. And, and what I wanted to show you is the, the big error, the, the, the grossest error that was going on here in this nation was idolatry. Was the making of a statue and bowing down to it. And I wanted to show you that in the history of Christianity, a large portion began to be called Roman Catholicism. And one of the largest things that it did in its form of worship is building statues, images, icons, and idols and falling into gross idolatry just like Ahab did here. And God has judged that thing to the point where it is a desert. It is barren. It is unfruitful. There is no life in Roman Catholicism. None. I got an article on your screen. I want you to bring it up to me. It's, it's right on there. And I want to get some. Now, this is some literature. This is the Catechism of the Catholic Church itself. This is what they give to the lay people. This is... Uh, Apostolic Constitution, Philae Depositum, Catechism, following, and it's signed here by the Pope himself, given on the 30th anniversary of the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council in the 14th year of my pontificate, and here it is signed by Johannes Paulus II, and this is the catechism that they still give out. And in this particular catechism here, on page uh, 516, It says, um, Nevertheless, in the Old Testament, God ordained and permitted the making of images. And then he, he goes on to talk about the bronze serpent. 
and the covenant, uh, the, the Ark of the Covenant and the cherubim. And so therefore, basing itself on the mystery of the incarnate word, the seventh ecumenical council of Nicaea has justified the veneration of icons and idols and also the mother of God and angels and the saints. Uh, there is not one single scriptural reference. This is paragraph 2131 on page 516 of the Catechism. And uh, this uh, began, and this is another book I have here. This is called the Catholicism Against Itself. And what he does here is this author uses their own writings in their encyclopedias to uh, show the conflicting hypocritical uh, verses that they have all throughout their religious uh, ceremonies. And let me see if I can find the one here that I had. It's uh, page 35, and here's what he found. He said, um, after the Church of Christ began, within a couple hundred years, it began to depart from the Word of God. And a great many pagan practices were introduced into worship. This all happened around 320 and 30 and 40 AD when Constantine, the emperor, got baptized and, and became, if you will, a Catholic. And they had the first council of Nicaea. And at that first council, they began to allow uh, the introduction of images on coins into the churches. Until that time, there was never any images allowed, never any statues allowed. And he said, what happened is, as these uh, pagan uh, uh, practices were introduced into worship, naturally, there were Christians who objected and said, this is unscriptural. So the church leaders found a convenient method of overruling these people's objectives. Whenever they wanted to introduce a new practice from pagan worship, they would forge a document which alleged that this practice was actually ancient and had gone on for hundreds of years, and they would affix on the document the name of an apostle. And they would pretend that they just discovered this document, which was in actuality a forgery, and they would use it as proof that this brand new practice or teaching was scriptural after all because the apostle's name was attached to it. And so there's a history, a series of forgeries that went on in the Catholic Church from the 4th century all the way through to about the 11th century. And they admitted in their own writings, this is taken out of the Catholic Encyclopedia. And I have another book by a priest, and he admits that uh, the first thousand years of Catholicism cannot be found in the New Testament. He says it's basically a, 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 a system that was dreamed up by men who wanted to have power, and, and I'll bring that book uh, next week. And so he says here in terms of the uh, statues, page uh, 71, no crucifixes were ever found or mentioned in the, until the 6th century A.D. Catholic Encyclopedia, Volume 7, page 667. A crucifix is an, an idol. It's a picture, it's a, a sculpture of a man on a cross. Thou shalt make, I guess you might want to go to Exodus chapter 20 itself and, and read the way God writes this verse. Exodus chapter 20, I'll read it for you. And God says it like this. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Well, something in the earth beneath is men, people, and a crucifix, a picture of a man hanging on a cross. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. God is a spirit. You must worship him in spirit and truth, in the spiritual part of the spiritual eye of faith in your heart, not with the physical eye. That which is seen is temporal. That which is unseen is eternal. God is the eternal spirit. Okay, no, no such crucifix until the 6th century. Uh, where is the other one I have? 
uh, no scapulars for 1,200 years. A scapular is a piece of cloth they wear around their neck that has an image of uh, Mary on it. No such a thing existed for 1,200 years. How about statues in the church? No statues. He even admits it here in the Catechism on page 516. Until the Seventh Ecumenical Council at Nicaea, which is 787 A.D., no statues were in the churches. They justify that. Now, here's, here's the council itself. And this is uh, the, the dispute that went on. At the time, there were icon smashers. They were called iconoclast. Clast is to break. And they broke down these statues. They were suspicious of any art depicting God or humans. They demanded the destruction of idols and icons because they saw it as gross idolatry. Also, though, in the church, there were venerators of icons called iconodules, and they defended icons in the church. So in this particular council, what they determined was through the work of a man called St. John of Damascus, they determined that it was okay to have statues and I wanted to see the one verse he uses. The verse he uses to justify the making of statues is the Gospel of John, chapter 1 and verse 18. So let's take a look at it and see if we can justify a statue from that. Concerning the, here it is, here's his writing. And, I, and go to Gospel of John, chapter 1 and verse 18. This is the verse he uses to justify statues in the church. John 1.18, no man hath seen God at any time. And so he writes, because of that, icons and statues are necessary. Because God cannot be seen, therefore he must be depicted in a material way so that we can worship him better. This is St. John of Damascus. And so that's their justification for statues. And so what you see happening in the northern kingdom of Israel is a picture of what happened into Roman Catholicism, which is considered the largest branch of Christianity in the world. And it's not Christian. Any more than Ahab and his practices were Jewish. They were pagan. They just used the word Israel, just as uh, Catholics use the word Christian, but they're not Christians. A Roman Catholic is not a Christian. To be a Christian, you must have Christ in you. And to have Christ in you, you must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit, not of a statue, not of a sacrament. And so you want to see the, the portrait as to what's going on here is God showing in the history of the nation what was going to happen corporately in the history of the church. And the names have been changed to confuse the innocent. That's why the devil changes names. His ways are movable, so you can't not know them. But we're not ignorant of his devices. We have a book. Now, getting back to our good friend Elijah, historically. Historically, here's how Elijah accomplished what he did. Not only did he stay close to God, not only did he consecrate himself to God, not only did he read the Word of God, but here's something else he did. James chapter 5, verse 17 and 18 says, Elias, that's Elijah, the New Testament rendering, was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. And, and here's what he did. In, in a practical way, what God is showing you is the word of prophecy is woven together with the word of prayer. And together, prophecy and prayer turn the keys of the clouds of blessing. Both of them. Not one or the other. He was a man subject to like passions as we are. 
He was a man that was subject to a passion for the love of God. I mean, he prayed earnestly in, in, in his spirit. God wants that the communication. And, and he prayed earnestly in a holy indignation at the departure of his nation from God's word, at the apostasy in his nation. Go, I'm going to take you a few places. Go to Psalm 97. His spirit was stirred within him. And he was angry at the, at the behavior of this wicked king. And he was angry at the foolishness of the people that followed him. This Pied Piper that was leading him down the path of destruction. Psalm 97. Remember he said, uh, as the Lord God liveth. Verse 1. The Lord reigneth. Verse 7. Confounded be all they that serve graven images. That boast themselves of idols. Worship him. That's the Lord, all ye gods. Verse 9. Thou, Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all gods. And, and he, had a, he had a passion in his spirit for God. Look at verse 10. Ye that love the Lord hate evil. Are you subject to like passion? Do you hate evil? Do you hate this present evil world? Do you hate religious systems that damn men's souls? Do you hate when apostasy creeps into the body of Christ? Are you willing to stand against it? Elijah was. He, go to next book, Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8, uh, talking about wisdom, true wisdom, spiritual wisdom. Verse 8. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogancy, and the evil way. And the froward mouth, do I hate? That's God's wisdom. There's some things that God hates. Is your heart in tune with Him? Do you hate liars and deceitful men that, that deceive the simple and beguile the innocent into believing lies and get them to trust into systems that will damn their soul for eternity? Elijah did. Do you? Are you nonchalant toward it? Are you indifferent? You're lukewarm. Elijah prayed earnestly in a holy indignation at anyone that would turn away from the Word of God, especially someone that would claim the name of God and turn away from God. Uh, look at the same chapter. You're in the 8th chapter. Uh, uh, let's say verse of, uh, 15. By me, kings reign and princes decree justice. God has not ordained for kings and leaders, especially of his church, to be unjust and to promulgate lies. Uh, same chapter, 8th chapter, look at verse 33, 34. Hear instruction, be wise, refuse it not. And here's Elijah preaching at Ahab. You're supposed to be just, Ahab. You're supposed to love wisdom. You're supposed to hate evil. Uh, verse 34, blessed is the man that heareth me. Watching at my gates, waiting at the posts of my door. Verse 36, Ahab, but he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All that hate me love death. And Elijah prayed in a holy indignation against this type of stuff. And he also prayed in holy zeal for the, for the glory of God whose word was being ignored, whose word was being mocked, whose word was being defied right now. At 1 Peter uh, chapter 4, he says in verse 11, he says, uh, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. What's the only thing that glorifies God properly, rightly, perfectly? The Word of God. The Word of God. Not the words of men. And he prayed for the glory of God and zeal. And he prayed that it might not rain. And according to his prayers, the heavens did become brass. 
And then he prayed that it might rain again. Now, now we've seen historically, we've seen some practical application. There's a prophetic application to this man, Elijah. There's prophecy contained in here. We'll do a few more verses and we're done. Go to Revelation chapter 11. One of the reasons he's carried off into glory and translated, he's got some more work to finish in the future. Revelation 11. Now, Revelation chapters 6 through 19 are, are prophetic from the standpoint of where you and I are living today. We're living in uh, September of 2015. Uh, Revelation 6 through 19 hasn't kicked off yet. It will kick off in the future. It'll probably kick off in the next 20 years, but it, it's still yet to come. This is prophecy here. And here in this 11th chapter, in the midst of that time known as the time of Jacob's trouble, the time of the tribulation, it says that um, there was a, a given me, verse 1, a reed like a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. And in during the time of the tribulation, they're going to rebuild a temple in Jerusalem. And here... This uh, person is told to, to measure it. It says in verse 2, But the court which is without of the temple, leave out, measure it not, for it's given to the Gentiles. And the holy city, they shall tread underfoot forty and two months. That's three and a half years. That's the space of time that Elijah prayed and it didn't rain. Same space of time. Verse 3, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days. That's 1260 days. That's 42 months. And they'll prophesy clothed in sackcloth. And these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, these two witnesses, my two witnesses, verse 3, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. If any man will hurt them, he must be in this manner killed. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. And, and Elijah is one of these two witnesses that's going to come back and preach in the great tribulation. That's who he is. And and if you read this passage and you line it up, and we're in Revelation 11, if you were to go to Zechariah 4, verse 11, you see the connection. As Zechariah was given also a vision of the future and the time of the tribulation, Revel, uh, Zechariah chapter 4, And Zechariah is given all these uh, visions, uh, uh, eight visions in the first uh, six chapters. And, and they're all prophetic and they have to do with the nation Israel because the tribulation is for the nation Israel. God's got to take them through a time of trouble to purify them and turn them from Jacob, their natural way of thinking, to Israel, a spiritual way of thinking. And that's what he's got to do with that particular nation. And in the fourth chapter... He gets a vision here of God's Spirit uh, tells him that this is the candlestick of gold, vision number five. Uh, the angel talked with me, came again, waked me, as a man is waked out of sleep, and said unto me, What seest thou? And I looked and I said, Behold, a candlestick all of gold with a bowl upon the top of it and his seven lamps thereof and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof. And, and there's the candlestick. And in the book of Revelation, the candlestick represents in the Bible, it represents the illumination of God's Spirit to truth. Today the church is the candlestick because we have God's truth. And there at that time it's the nation Israel that's going to retake their place as the candlestick of God's truth. And during that time as the nation is being purified, verse 3, and two olive trees are by it. They're standing by the candlestick, one on the right side of the bowl and the other on the left. And I answered and said to the angel that talked with me, what are these? 
And, of course, the angel talked with me, answered, and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. And he answered, and he spake unto me, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by, by spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Verse 11. And then I answered and said, What are these two olive trees? And so, again, the candlestick representing the Spirit of God uh, and its light is going to be through the nation Israel. And what are these two olive trees on the right side of the candlestick and on the left? And I answered again and, and said, what be these two olive branches through the golden pipes empty themselves, the golden oil out of themselves? And basically they're going to be preachers of the word of God. Their pipes are going to be used, consecrated to God for em emptying the oil of the spirit of God as they preach. And uh, verse 13, he answered me and said, knowest thou not what these be? I said, no, my Lord. And here it is. Then he said, these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. And when's that fulfilled? Go to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. And when you get to the 17th chapter, look one verse before it, Matthew 16, 28. And here's Jesus telling his disciples, I verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste the death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Here's the Lord of the whole earth. Verse uh, 117. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, bringeth them up into a high mountain, and was transfigured before them. His face did shine as the sun, his raiment was white as the light, and behold, there appeared unto them. There's Moses and Elias, the two anointed ones standing by the Lord of the whole earth. There's Moses and Elijah right there. These are the two witnesses. You're in Matthew. Back up to the book right before Matthew. Malachi. Look at chapter 4. The last book of the Old Testament is God tells his people to get ready. The day is coming. The Son of Righteousness is going to come. And then he says, verse 4, Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant. And there's a name that he gives a mention to. And then verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And the great and dreadful day is when he comes for Armageddon and he holds the whole world in judgment. And before they come, there's Moses and Elijah. And there was the picture of the two of them standing there. Both Moses and Elijah preached against types of the Antichrist. And both Moses and Elijah will preach against the Antichrist. Ahab was the type of the Antichrist against whom uh, Elijah preached. If you go to uh, 1 Kings chapter 21 and verse 20, it, it says, uh, says it like this. Let me see, I'll get it for you. 1 Kings 21. And verse 20. And Ahab said to Elijah, Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? And he, Elijah, answered Ahab, I found thee because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. Just like Judas gave him place to the devil. And Judas is a type of the Antichrist, so was Ahab. And Moses also preached against a type of the Antichrist that would be Pharaoh. In Exodus uh, chapter 5 and verse 2, when Moses went to preach before the Pharaoh, Pharaoh said, uh, Moses said, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who's the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. And then later on in the book of Ezekiel chapter 29, God tells the prophet Ezekiel, through the Holy Ghost. He says in Ezekiel 29, verse 2 and 3, Son of man, set thy face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, prophesy against him and all Egypt. Speak and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lieth in the midst of the rivers. And so Moses preached against the type of the Antichrist, Pharaoh, 
Elijah preached against the type of the Antichrist, Ahab, and both of them will be brought back before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and they will preach against the real Antichrist prophetically. So we got through verse 1. Next week we'll, we'll, we'll try and cover the rest of the chapter, and I'll try and make a little better time with you. But Elijah is very important, so I wanted to take time to introduce him. He's God's man for God's hour. You know, there's apostasy in the church today. It's God's hour. Why don't we pray he raises up a few more Elijahs, particularly this week with the Pope visiting. There's a type of the Antichrist. Lord, thank you for this uh, chapter. Help us to uh, pray earnestly and be man like passion of Elijah. And Lord, uh, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.